have a bunch of outstanding sample libraries, but you're afraid to use them because you'll sound just like everyone else who has those same sample libraries? No? It's just me? Oh, okay. Today, I'll show you how to make them sound worse by destroying this cassette tape. Now, as much as I love sample libraries, and I think there are some incredible ones out there that are incredibly unique and characterful, I try to avoid using them straight out of the box or in the box if possible. That's actually one of the reasons that I got into synthesis so heavily was somehow to my weirdly dysfunctional brain that seemed more authentic than using someone else's perfectly curated string orchestra recordings. I really enjoy finding sounds that are my own and are unique to me. So I found a bit of a workaround for using string samples in a way that not everyone else is using them by making them sound worse with tape. So what will you need to actually implement these ideas for yourself? A cassette tape with screws to allow you to open it and get at the insidey parts, as opposed to one like this, which as you can see is sealed plastic and there is no way of opening this cassette. Or is there? I'm just gonna put this away. So what I have here is a Maxwell cassette, tiny screws. Here I have a Sony cassette, no tiny screws. You will need a small Phillips head screwdriver. For running a loop outside of the cassette, like we'll be doing today, you'll need something to break the cassette casing on the side so that the tape can actually run outside of the casing. For that, I like to use this pair of wire cutters, oddly, which I found works pretty well for cutting the plastic and also breaking it free uh, without leaving too terribly jagged of an edge to snag the tape. You will need the other kind of tape, a four track cassette recorder. You can use one of the Tascams. I have one of those sitting over there somewhere. Uh, or in my case, I'm using the Yamaha MT400, which is my favorite cassette deck. You don't have to have a four track, but obviously that will affect the number of tracks that you can record onto the tape. A pair of scissors so that you can cut both of these types of tape. Something cool and vintage looking to run the tape loop around. And maybe most importantly, an overwhelming sense of inferiority about your own work that overpowers your extreme lack of patience when trying to align this fiddly little tape loop onto the cassette. Check. So why are we even doing this? Well, tape loops introduce imperfections and instability and character to sounds. And we also, those of us who grew up with cassettes, have a sense of nostalgia from the cassette sound. Even the tape hiss is kind of nostalgic for me. So. I kind of lean into all of those things rather than trying to avoid them. So inherently, no two loops are going to sound the same. They're all going to be a little different based on the length, the warbliness, how tight they are around this, the tape deck that you're recording and playing them back on. There are so many variables that are going to make even the most sterile string samples sound interesting and varied and unique to you. Now it's time to actually make this thing. I'll try to keep the tape actually in the shot so that you can see what's happening. Uh, this is what we like to call unscrewing screws, which is incredibly fascinating to watch. Definitely won't make YouTube retention go down at all. As we open up the cassette, we can see that we have these little bits of film uh, that have the logos and everything on it. You don't need that. I'm going to remove the spools of tape at this point. Uh, be careful as you're doing this that you don't lose these little uh, wheels that the tape runs around, the rollers. You will need those so that the tape can still feed through. However, we do not need both of these spools for what we are doing today. And slide out this little piece and there we have a empty reel and that won't stay in. Okay, this would probably be a good time to talk about the length of the loop. Four track recorders like this play back and record at a rate of 4.75, 3.75, like I said, inches per second. Now, if you have just a standard cassette player, that's gonna play back at half of that speed, 1.875. Now, if you'll notice, we have speed controls here on the Yamaha deck. Uh, with 4.8 and 9.5 respectively, depending on how you have the switch selected. And that's going to be centimeters because this is a Japanese unit. So we're going to actually, when we get there, record at 9.5. Uh, and then we might try some half speed stuff just to see how that works. But I do like recording at the higher speed so I can slow it down later. So obviously if we're recording at 3.75 inches per second, 
you can kind of decide how long you want your loop to be using basic math. And that is more important if you're gonna be running the loop inside the tape, you need a specific length. Today, we're not gonna be running the loop inside the tape and we're gonna be doing like drones that I can play with the deck itself. So it doesn't really matter how long it is. I want it to be long enough and running outside of the tape so that I can manipulate it by hand. And it has a little extra warble and a little extra time to evolve. I'm just gonna cut off this white part, which is the lead and does not contain any information. And I'm just gonna unspool some tape. <coughs> oh God, okay. So what I'm going to do is kind of gauge the length of the loop that I need by how I'm going to be running it, which is around this uh, little lamp here, which is basically the mascot of my channel at this point. So I'm gonna say somewhere in this range is where I'm going to cut this tape. I'm gonna try to cut it in a straight line if I can. Boom, got it. Don't need this anymore, so we're gonna set that to the side. I'm a little sticky because it's already like 100 degrees in my studio. Now this can be a little bit tricky. I'm gonna have to spread this out. You can kind of see by the way that the tape falls, which is the inside and which is the outside of the loop. So I'm just gonna make sure that it is all going the same direction. I'm sure that's going out of frame. Oh my God. Oh. Oh. So what we have here is a disaster. We are almost there. We've got a twist down here that I'm gonna need to work out. Get off of my finger! Okay, we finally come to the point where we can take our other kind of tape. And I'm going to lay out a little strip right there. These scissors, really not ideal for this. They're a bit too large. But we're gonna see if I can cut a strip about the same width as the tape, maybe even a little narrower than the tape. It would really help if I weren't shaking horrendously. So I'm gonna cut a strip like that. Boom, got it. Look at that, such precision. Now the key here is you wanna tape on the inside of the loop. And that's because obviously the information is running along the outside, which uh, goes across the playhead and the record head. See if I can get this to lay flat. This one is so curved, it's gonna be difficult. Yeah, it is not cooperating. This can be maybe the biggest pain is getting this lined up somewhat. Okay, there we go, that's not bad actually. And we actually want the two ends of the tape to meet as squarely as possible so that there's not a huge gap there. Did I do that right? Okay, it should be this way. I almost messed that up. You don't really want to uh, have a kink <laughs> in your loop, that would not be ideal. See if I can get that to lie flatter. Turn loose. Yeah, I'm actually sticking to the tape more than the tape is sticking to the tape. That's not great. Not too bad. You can see there's a tiny gap in there and that actually can be kind of interesting. Uh, I know Blank Forms talks a lot about playing around with the gap. Uh, you'll hear it. You'll hear the tape kind of skip a beat there, but it creates kind of a character and a little bit of a wobbly bump for the loop. I think we're good. I think that's a pretty good loop actually. Now the second most frustrating thing is going to be getting this back into the cassette tape itself. So now we're gonna take this and I'm gonna use this empty spool that I set aside earlier. There's a little ridge that that wheel sits on. And now I have to try to get this threaded back through somewhat the way that it used to be. No one told me that my hands would be this sweaty. No! Before we do that, we have got to do something about this case because it is still enclosed and it can't be that way if we want the tape to get out of it. So you can see that this side right here is uh, got to be cut out. And I'm gonna start over here actually. I put a snip right there below that tab. Sometimes it breaks the cassette. We're gonna hope that doesn't happen. It's just not gonna cut it at all today. Of course, come on. All right, there's one snip and a tiny piece of plastic that I can step on later. Uh, it's gonna break. This, this cassette does not feel sturdy whatsoever. 
Oh no. Okay, it's just gonna come out one piece at a time. We can probably still salvage it. And it came out relatively clean there. I'm gonna take these out for now. Be sure you don't lose them. I wonder if that's enough. No, don't lose that either. Shh. I'm gonna need to cut out a little bit at the bottom too. This doesn't have to be perfect, but the tape does have to be able to somewhat cleanly get out of the... the good news is once you have a few of these loops lying around you don't have to make a new one every time you just record over it right that's why i'm so out of practice and terrible oh now that is relatively smooth now to de-sweat my hands enough to actually thread this through Now the moment of truth uh, to find out if this thing actually works. I did have to have a little bit of help from Erbach. Let's see how she pulls through. I'm kind of looking at uh, where I tape the tape together. Let's see how that goes across the playhead. Hey, it got stuck. Oh no, what did I do? It may be too tight. No, it's eating. It's eating the tape. And sometimes this happens, and what is happening is it's getting stuck. Yeah, I didn't make that break smooth enough, so I'm just going to have to clean that out just a little bit so that the tape can get through more cleanly. I'm going to try to lift this out without totally destroying everything that I did of threading the tape through. Now I get to put everything back together. <laughs> it's gonna be worth it, guys, I promise. <laughs> I have the tape back in the cassette now, and one of the mistakes that I made was not threading the tape. I don't know if you can see through. There's a little plastic post in there between the wheel and the outside of the case. So that gives it a little bit more clearance <clears throat> so that the hole doesn't have to be quite so big, but I did go ahead and clean out uh, the hole that I made on the end of the tape, if you can see that. Uh, from the above shot. Now we're gonna put this back in and hope and pray that we have a little bit more success this time. Let's try this again and see what happens. I'm gonna tighten up the tension just a little bit. Okay, it fed through that time. I'll let it run around again. It is, it is not smoothly going through. I'm gonna loosen the tension just a little bit. A looser tape will lead to a bit more warble anyway, which is a good thing. A little bit more instability. Yeah, that helped. Still hiccups a little bit. I don't know how it's going to sound, but that's kind of the beauty of tape loops, right? I promised you imperfection, and imperfection you shall have. It is at least running on through, so we'll see what happens when we actually start recording this. The string library that I'm going to be using today is Olafur Arnold's Evolutions which is already a really great library. I would give it five out of five Henson's for sure. And I think it's gonna work incredibly well with a tape loop to make all of those evolutions even more unstable, unpredictable, and it's gonna be something a little bit more unique. So what I have here in my DAW is four chords, each one of them set to loop, uh, and I'm gonna record each chord onto a separate track on my four track recorder. Cassette tapes are only capable of handling four tracks at a time, so that's going to allow us to play through it like a progression. And I realize Alessandro Cortini did this very technique with a Nine Inch Nails tour, but it's a great idea. And as I said before, no two tape loops sound the same, so it's always going to be a little bit different. And plus, this will be my four chords and not the four chords from Hurt. So now there's nothing left to do but record each of these four chords to my cassette loop. Okay, so the loop is done. I'm gonna make some adjustments here on my EQ and panning. Generally, what I like to do is boost the mid. 
maybe reduce the highs just a bit as well. So now we can play this loop back and actually perform the loop itself. Typically what I would do is just record various performances of me bringing in the various chords in and out, adjusting the panning, playing with some effects, which you may have noticed there are a pair of meat mod delays right here from Fairfield Circuitry, which we'll get to in just a minute. That's gonna really make this thing sound incredible. So let's see what happens as I bring these in and out. And I'm gonna slowly introduce the meat mods, which I have one on the left side and one on the right side of my sends here. Um, so that I basically have stereo analog delay. And the great thing about these Fairfield circuitry units, um, the meat mods, just like the uh, shallow water pedals, they have a sort of tape emulation instability to them, which you can control with these switches here. I've done videos about this pedal in the past. And so they're doing random modulations to the sound and the tape speed. And having two of them, one on the left and one on the right, that's really gonna make this sound wide. So yeah, this should be a really incredible setup. I am really excited to hear what it sounds like when it all comes together myself. Very curious. Bring in some effects now. Wow. <laughs> Still going. Incredible. Yeah, I'd say that's worth it. I am super inspired and I'm definitely gonna make something out of this for sure. So you can see that I was experimenting some with manually ma manipulating the tape to provide a little bit of speed up and slow down. Um, you can kind of grip it like that to create kind of a little tape stop. I'm playing with the speed just a bit there as well. I do have a speed control on the unit itself. And then the magic button that I haven't gotten to yet, which is the half speed button. And I'm gonna use that along with these delays. And I think that might be really magical. So boom, half speed we go. It's gonna be an octave lower now.
All right. Well, that's gonna be something. That's incredible. That actually surpassed my expectations there. So I'm really excited to build some things out with that. And I've already got some ideas of uh, some things that I might do to flesh this out into a full-fledged track, so. Six and a half hours later. Well, I did in fact turn this into a track. I recorded some old piano tracks that I had lying around to the Make Noise Morphogene and came up with this little background ambient thing. Comes in a bit later, the second layer. And of course, the root of this track is indeed that tape loop that we just made. And I included some bass from the Pro 3. And then at the end it comes back, but half speed. With some morphogene stuff over the top. So to improve this track, I ended up giving my good friend Sean Williams a call. Now Sean is an incredible violinist and string player, also an outstanding composer and producer in his own right. Go check out his work if you have not. And he added some outstanding high fidelity string parts, which really gave some width and depth to this track and really counterbalance and played off of the lo-fi tape loop that I created in a really wonderful way, exactly the way that I had hoped that it would. So if you want to hear the rest of this track, it's the first link in the description. It's available on Spotify, Apple Music, all of those places that you normally get your music. We would really appreciate it if you would give it some love and especially go check Sean out because he's incredible and I was absolutely thrilled with what he brought to the table. Also, if you want to check out this video right here, I talk a little bit more about the Fairfield Circuitry Meat Mod, which is one of my favorite delays now. Incredible analog delay. And now that I have two of them, I like them twice as much. Make some tape loops of your very own, and don't be afraid to take your favorite sample libraries and make them sound worse. Bye.